Hello, I'm David Edmondson, a tax manager with Davy Kaplan. And today I'd like to discuss with you key tax changes in the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. Uh, now this is a very beneficial legislation that was passed by Congress in December of last year and signed into law by the president on the 27th. Some key changes in this law are very favorable changes in the payroll protection loan program, the employee retention credit, and there are also several other changes for both businesses and individuals um, that I'd like to talk about. Now the payroll protection loan program or PPP loan program was a very popular loan program for businesses affected by COVID-19 that allowed forgivable loans as long as the proceeds were spent on eligible expenses. A key concern with this was the deductibility of the expenses related to guidance that came out from the IRS. So originally in the CARES Act, Congress specified that the forgiveness of indebtedness income from the forgiveness of the loan would not be considered taxable income for borrowers. The IRS, however, opined that because these expenses were paid with tax exempt income, they would not be deductible for federal income tax purposes, which would effectively make the loan still a taxable event. So we are very happy to see that in the Consolidated Appropriations Act, Congress confirmed its original intent by stating that the PPP loan forgiveness would not cause a reduction in otherwise deductible expenses that were tax basis. Uh, similarly, we were concerned about the state tax treatment. Um, in New York State in particular, the state for individual tax purposes decoupled from amendments to the Internal Revenue Code, beginning with the CARES Act. So any tax law changes in the CARES Act and in the Consolidated Appropriations Act are ignored for purposes of calculating New York State taxable income, which normally begins with federal income. So this implied that the income from the PP loan forgiveness might be considered an add back to taxable income for New York State purposes. Now, guidance recently received from New York State in the forms used to calculate the additions and subtractions to federal income to calculate New York State taxable income specifically did not include an increase for PPP loan forgiveness. So at this time, it appears that individual taxpayers, including partners and partnerships and S corporation shareholders, will not see an increase in income from the PPP loan forgiveness. Interestingly, C corporations didn't have this problem because New York State did not decouple from those provisions for C corporations. So currently PPP loan forgiveness should not create taxable income for C corporations either, unless New York State passes the law to specifically decouple from that treatment. Um, we're also seeing simplified loan forgiveness applications uh, available to PPP loan borrowers whose loans are under $150,000. So this will be a simplified one-page forgiveness application, um, which would be much easier for borrowers to fill out than the full application. We're also seeing in the Consolidated Appropriations Act several new types of expenditures on which the PPP loan proceeds can be used. Uh, this includes operations expenditures, such as payments for business software and cloud computing services, property damage costs that were incurred due to public disturbances in 2020 that were not covered by insurance or other compensation, certain supplier costs for contracts that were in place before the covered period or in the case of perishable goods during the covered period, and uh, certain worker protection expenditures, both for PPE and also for certain capital improvements, such as uh, sneeze guards, air filtration systems, or even expanding space to provide more social distance. Now, the original PPP loan program, what uh, Congress is currently calling the first straw program, uh, was closed to new applicants on August 8th. Um, this program is now under the Consolidated Appropriations Act being reopened for new applica applicants and also has received additional funding. So borrowers who were in operation as of February 15, 2020, and uh, meet the other requirements will be eligible to apply for a first time loan. Uh, some types of categories of businesses that will be eligible 
are those with 500 and fewer employees that are otherwise eligible for SBA 790 loans, uh, sole proprietors, independent contractors, eligible self-employed individuals, not-for-profits, not including churches, and several other categories of businesses. Um, and there is a list of various types of businesses that are not eligible. Now, these loans will still be a maximum of $10 million, and uh, the calculation of the loan amount is still done by multiplying average monthly payroll costs by 2.5. However, the borrowers in 2020 may now either use their 2019 or 2020 payroll costs to calculate the maximum loan amount. And the SBA is beginning to accept applications for this first draw program today for certain small community lenders and shortly thereafter for other banks. Another piece of good news is that a second PPP loan program is now available for borrowers who already received their first loan program. So businesses that already received a PPP loan and have used or expect to use the full amount of the loan program may now apply for a second draw if they meet certain slightly more restrictive requirements. So first applicants must generally have 300 or fewer employees with certain exceptions. Uh, and they need to show a decline of gross receipts in 2020 as compared to 2019. Now, the way this is calculated is that businesses will take their quarterly receipts and need to show that any quarter in 2020 was down by at least 25% as compared to 2019. So you don't need to pass all four quarters. You just need to show that one quarter had a 25% dip in gross receipts. Now, the uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act um, did not define uh, the definition of gross receipts, and in a, in a slide in a minute, we'll, we'll uh, explain what that is. Now, the maximum loan amount for the second draw loans is reduced from the original loan amount of $10 million to only $2 million, and it is calculated still by using 2.5 times average monthly payroll costs. Um, however, for the second draw loan program, Applicants may use either calendar year 2018 payroll, 2019 payroll, or any 365-day period within 2018 and 2019. There is a more favorable calculation for food service and accommodation businesses that may receive up to 3.5 times average monthly payroll. However, they are still limited to the maximum 2 million. Now, as I was saying, the uh, receipts are, we're not defined under the Consolidated Appropriations Act. Uh, so the SBA is defining these based on existing SBA regulations, which define gross receipts for the purposes of the 25% test as including substantially all revenue received or accrued in accordance with the entity's accounting method. So this could include sales from products and services, net returns and allowances, interest, dividends, rents and royalties, fees, commissions, and the like. Now, this does not include certain transactions with affiliates, um, and uh, notably, it does not include the income from first draw loans that were forgiven. This program will be open until March 31st of 2021. However, like with the first draw program, there is a set amount of funding that's available, and uh, applicants who wait too long may find that the program has run out of funds. Now, this program will, the SBA will begin accepting programs for this second draw loan program on Wednesday of this week, January 13th, initially through small business lenders as it was through the first draw program. Um, however, will be expanded shortly for other institutions. And the SBA has released a new form, Form 2483 SD, that will be used for the second draw loan program. And both this uh, new form for the second draw loan program and the uh, application for the first draw loan program that's been revised are both available on the SB website currently. There were some other changes to the PPP loan program as well. Uh, applicants may now choose any covered period between eight and 24 weeks. So previously, uh, applicants could choose either eight weeks or 24 weeks. Uh, now you can choose 8, 10, 15, whatever amount matches how long it takes to spend the proceeds. Um, and there has been an expansion of the definition of payroll costs 
for purposes of the PVP loan program. So now um, payroll costs will include not only wages um, and health insurance, but will also include, include group life insurance, disability, vision, and dental insurance. Now, these changes in the definition of payroll costs and other changes that were made to the program as a result of interim legislation have left some lenders or some borrowers rather in the situation where they could have received a larger initial loan if the rules had been the same when they originally uh, made their application. So the SBA is allowing applicants who already received a PPP loan that has not already been forgiven to request an increase in the original loan amount if uh, these rules changed either from interim rules or based on the Consolidated Appropriations Act um, after the time that they originally applied. Uh, the SBA has indicated that this increase in the original loan amount will be made through the original lender and um, these increases will be may be requested through March 31st. Um, now the guidance we're seeing from the SBA is that if the uh, applicant's loan was not forgiven by December 27th, then they'll be eligible to request an increase in the loan. We've also seen some changes in the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program or EIDL loan. Um, now this is a loan program that was also available to businesses impacted by COVID-19. It wasn't quite as favorable as the PPP loan program because it wasn't 100% forgivable like the PPP loan program was, um, but it did include an advance of up to $10,000 that could be received on the front end that was uh, a grant that did not be, was not required to be repaid. Um, now, originally under the laws regarding the EIDL loan program and the PPP loan program, this amount that was advanced was considered a reduction in the forgivable amount of the PPP loan. Um, under the Consolidated Appropriations Act, the EIDL grant will no longer reduce the forgiveness of the PPP loan program. And the SBA has updated its platform as of Friday to no longer reduce forgiveness amounts for the EIDL loan. And the SBA has indicated that they will automatically re remit a reconciliation payment to lenders to repay the additional remaining amount of the loan that was not forgiven due to the item. Another benefit under the SBA program that uh, was available to businesses impacted by COVID-19 were subsidy payments that were made to borrowers who already had an SBA loan in existence um, in the spring. These lenders could receive, or these borrowers rather, uh, could receive six months of payments made by the SBA on their loan, both principal and interest. Uh, the new act has confirmed that these payments will not be considered taxable income for federal income tax purposes, and like the PPP loan forgiveness, will not reduce otherwise deductible expenses. Additionally, businesses may be eligible for an additional three months of subsidy payments beginning this February um, with borrowers in certain industries, such as food service, recreation, and accommodation, el eligible to receive five additional months. These subsidy payments will be capped uh, for the new uh, round of payments at $9,000 per month per eligible loan. Now we're also seeing uh, favorable changes in the employee retention credit. Now, this is a credit that was available with the CARES Act. However, there was an interaction with the PPP loan program where certain borrowers who took PPP loans were ineligible for the employee retention credit, or should I say all borrowers. Um, now, in 2020, this credit was calculated as being 50% of the first $10,000 of eligible wages per employee in 2020 which could result in a maximum credit of $5,000 per employee. So for 2021, this benefit has been made more lucrative. So the new calculation 
allows a credit of up to 70% of the first $10,000 of wages. And this is calculated per quarter rather than annually. So under the uh, 2020 credit, businesses could receive $5,000 per employee uh, annually. And in 2021, for the first six months of 2021, employers may receive a credit of up to $7,000 per employee per quarter, so that would be $14,000 for the first two quarters. Um, there is also limitations on increased wages for employees compared to what the employee was receiving in the prior 30 days, and this limitation has been removed for the 2021. Now, to be eligible for this program, businesses that were considered small businesses had to meet one of two requirements. They either Either their business had to be fully or partially suspended due to orders from a government authority limiting commerce, travel, or group meetings due to COVID-19, meaning that uh, some official limitation on your business, such as uh, restaurants that were limited to 50% capacity, say, or um, businesses that um, could only have a certain number of employees on site, um, any, anything like that that restricted your business, or they had to show a decline in gross receipts. And for 2019, businesses had to show in any quarter that they received these credits, they had to show a 50% decline in 2020 credits as compared to 2019. Now, this uh, calculation has been made more favorable in 2019. So, I mean, sorry, in 2021. So in 2021, businesses must only be able to show a 20% decline in gross receipts. And uh, notably, this calculation is done still based on 2019 gross receipts rather than 2020 gross receipts. Now, large employers uh, will still see additional limitations. So in 2020, large employers, in addition to having to meet one of the first two requirements, also could only claim the credit for employees who are not working. So employees that were furloughed and sent home and were not able to work at all, but were still paid, were eligible for this credit for businesses that had over 100 full-time equivalent employees. In 2021, the full-time equivalent employee threshold was raised to 500 full-time equivalent employees before businesses are subject to this more restrictive form. Now, the interaction with the PPP loan has been uh, reduced so that more businesses are now eligible for this credit. So previously, recipients of a PPP loan were completely ineligible to receive employee retention credit. Going forward, this limitation has been removed. However, payroll costs may not be double dipped. So payroll costs that were used for forgiveness of the PPP loan may not be claimed for the employee retention credit. Um, and if you uh, claim payroll costs, as a forgivable expense on the PPP loan, but you had more payroll costs than you needed, the excess can still be used for the employee retention. There's a similar interaction with the Families First and Coronavirus Relief Act credits. Uh, for both 2020 and 21, 2021, eligible wages for the employee retention credit may not include wages that were the basis for qualified paid sick leave or qualified paid family leave credits under the Families First and Coronavirus Response Act. Um, additionally, uh, wages used for the existing employer credit for paid family medical leave or wages used for the work opportunity credit are also ineligible for the employee retention. Uh, now, uh, employers receiving these credits in 2021 may still request an advance on the credits, however, uh, only an advance of 70% of average quarterly wages paid in 19 will be allowed. And um, the advances are limited to employers with fewer than 500 full-time equivalent employees. Now this credit is a refundable payroll tax credit. And so it is claimed on an, a business's Form 941 quarterly payroll tax return. Um, now we're waiting for guidance that hopefully will allow businesses to claim this as a one-time catch-up at the end of the year, rather than requiring amending all of the quarterly form 940. Uh, which uh, businesses know um, when we hear more guidance on. 
Now, in addition to the very favorable changes to the PPP loan program and the employee retention credit, there are also changes to note for both individuals and businesses. So one of the most uh, newsworthy items for individuals was the second round of economic stimulus payments. These uh, have already started going out and uh, are reduced from $1,200 per person maximum as it was for the first round of payments to $600 maximum, um, with an additional $600 eligible for children who are eligible for the child tax credit. Now, this calculation uh, will be based on uh, individuals 2019 individual tax return. And like with the first round of payments, this advance, this payment is considered an advance on a credit that will be calculated on an individual's 2020 tax return. So what this means is that taxpayers who had a decline in taxable income in 2020 may be eligible for an increased credit that is refundable on the 2020 tax return. However, uh, nobody will be required to repay refundable, recreate, repay advances that they already received. So there's no clawback in these payments. We also saw a favorable change in the expenses for medical expenses. Um, currently, there is a 7.5 threshold for medical expenses whereby uh, those expenses have to reach 7.5% of adjusted gross income before they're deductible as an itemized deduction. This threshold was scheduled to increase to 10% in 2021. Um, however, the Consolidated Appropriations Act has made it uh, permanently set at 7.5%, so it will no longer increase. We're also seeing expanded opportunities for charitable contributions. So for uh, Taxpayers who do not itemize, who take the standard deduction, um, in 2020, there was a $300 above the line itemized deduction allowed for cash contributions to eligible charities. And in 2021, we're again seeing a $300 deduction available, and this will be up to $600 for married family joint return. We're also seeing an uh, increase in the EGI limitation for charitable deductions. So as it was in 2020, in 2021, individuals will be able to take itemized deductions up to 100% of adjusted gross income. There were also favorable uh, provisions for carrying over amounts from FSA accounts from 2020 to 2021 and to 2022. And we're also seeing the possibility of certain employers, employees being able to make mid-year perspective changes in FSA contribution in 2020. And there were some notable tax extenders for individuals. The mortgage interest insurance premium was extended through 2021. The exclusion for income for cancellation of indebtedness on a principal residence was extended through 2025. And we did see the deduction for qualified tuition and fees repealed after 2020. However, it was replaced with an increased income phase-out threshold for the lifetime learning program. We also saw some changes for businesses in addition to the PPP loan and employee retention credit. Um, so the qualified sick leave and family leave credits under the Families First and Coronavirus Relief Act are extended through March of this year. Also, the new markets tax credit and the work opportunity tax credit are extended five years through 2025. The employer credit for paid family and medical leave is extended through 2025, and several energy credits are extended through 2021. We're also seeing an increase in deductions for business meals that are available in 2021 and 2022. So normally, Business meals are only 50% deductible for federal income tax purposes. However, in 2021 and 2022, this meals provided by a restaurant will be fully deductible um, for federal, federal income tax purposes. Um, we also saw some favorable changes in depreciation life for real property businesses electing to be exempt from the business interest limitation rules. And we also saw the Section 179B Energy Efficient Commercial Buildings deduction was made permanent this year. So this provision will no longer be subject to renewal every two or three years. 
So that was just an overview of some of the major provisions in this act. There are uh, many more provisions and many more details to the provisions we discussed. So we encourage uh, viewers to reach out to your contact at Davy Kaplan if you have questions about these new laws or how they will affect your income tax purposes. So uh, that concludes our presentation. Thank you for attending and have a great day.